Well, here we are. It's the day after the most controversial and divisive presidential election of our entire lifetime. And as we continue to wait for the election results, uh, there's no doubt in, you know, that the political agenda of both parties has completely divided our country. Uh, we see this in the election. I mean, our country is, is divided. And, 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 and it's sad that the evidence of this division can actually be found in every area of our nation. Uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the Democrats, uh, well, they're quick to accuse the Republicans of being racist fascists who are suppressing votes. And many Republicans are accusing the Democrats of being Marxist communists who are trying to steal the election, you know, and, and boom, there it is. There, you know, we, we start, you know, dividing from one another. Uh, without debate, this election has only highlighted the fact that America is not one nation under God, nor are we indivisible. And we are very, very divisible. You know, we are completely divided. And, and we're divided by two distinctly different political agendas, and it's sad to say that this division is actually impacting every, every state, every city. It's, it's impacting families. I mean, there's family members that won't talk to other family members right now. And, and what's even worse is that this political divide is also causing conflict within every Christian community. With that being the case, I just wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of reset our focus so that we might be a church that is unified that we might be a church that's unified by what is most important, which is our commitment to Christ Jesus. But that being the case, I just wanted to take this opportunity, like I said, to, to just refocus our attention. And, and with this as our goal, I want to remind you of something that Jesus said as he stood trial before a Roman ruler named Pilate. If you would, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 18. Now, as you make your way to the 18th, 18th chapter of John's gospel account, I just want to take a moment to remind you that those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have actually become the citizens of another country. We've become the citizens of another country. We've, we've transferred our citizenship, so to speak. And, and we've transferred our citizenship to a country which is ruled by not just any old king, but the king of kings. We're talking about King Jesus and it's for this reason that the Apostle Peter referred to believers as sojourners and pilgrims. We're just passing through. Simply put, every Christian, regardless of our earthly residency, has transmitted our citizenship uh, to the kingdom of God. And, and while I believe that every Christian ought to do what we can to legislate Christian morality here in our country, it's also important for us to remember that the unity of Christian community, it isn't based on earthly politics. No, instead, our unity is based on our commitment to serve our sovereign leader, King Jesus. In order to make my case, I want to consider the conversation that we find here in John chapter 18. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 33, here John writes, Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus, he's identifying himself as the king of a heavenly kingdom. The apostle John confirms this in Revelation chapter 17, where he referred to Jesus as the Lord of lords and the king of kings. He's not just a Lord. He's not just a king. He is the Lord of lords and he is the king of kings. And while it's true that Jesus is the king of kings, it's also true that his first advent wasn't based on a kingly military campaign which was designed to come in and conquer the kingdoms of this world. 
His first advent, his first coming, it wasn't to conquer this world, but instead the first advent of our Messiah was designed to provide us with the opportunity to surrender before the invasion. That's why he came the first time. He came riding a donkey, a king riding a donkey. That was a symbol of a king coming in peace. But it was an opportunity for us to surrender before the invasion. In order to prove my point, I want to consider the military campaign that is going to occur at the time of Christ's second coming. If you would, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. And as you make your way to the 19th chapter of Revelation, I just want to take a moment to remind you that there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. He's going to rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years. This is what we call the millennial kingdom of Christ. But before establishing his throne there in Jerusalem, before taking the throne of, of, of David and ruling from it, before all that happens, he will first conquer the kingdoms of this world. With this as the focus, let's consider John's prophetic account, which is found here in Revelation chapter 19. Look with me there, beginning at verse 11. Here the apostle declares, now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Christian listeners, coming a day when the king of kings returns to establish his millennial kingdom right here on earth. He's not riding a donkey, he's riding a white horse. A king riding a white horse like this was a symbol of, of a king coming to conquer. This is not, there's not gonna be an election. He's not gonna, you know, run some polls to see how his, you know, popularity is doing. He doesn't need 270 electoral votes to take the throne. And I can assure you that his rise to power is not going to be based on popular vote. No, he's simply going to conquer every kingdom with this military campaign, which will result in the punishment of those who reject his federal authority. With that being the case, it's important for every Christian to remember that the Lord Jesus is eventually going to strike the nations of this world as he comes to conquer every single kingdom. And notice that it doesn't say he's going to strike all the nations, well, except for America. All the nations. Every single one. He's going to conquer all of the nations here on earth. And it's at that point in time when the king of kings will begin to rule all of the nations of the world with a rod of iron, meaning it's going to be strict enforcement. They say no justice, no peace. Well, you better believe that it's going to be 100% pure justice and as a result, 100% pure peace. That being the case, it's crucial for every Christian to realize that we have no continuing country here on this earth. If we're spending our time and spinning our wheels trying to you know, make some sort of utopia out of America, uh, if you think that we can establish some sort of continuing country, if we just vote the right people into office and legislate all the correct laws, I'm here to tell you that the Bible is quite clear. There is no continuing country here on this world right now but we seek one that's to come. 
And while we ought to pray that the Lord will give us leaders who will in fact do what they're supposed to do by punishing evildoers, every Christian must also remember, remember that we aren't called to set up an earthly kingdom for Christ. There, there are some Christians who think that way. There are some Christians who, who have bought into this manifest sons of Christ concept that, you know, if we, if we can just save enough people and if we can just legislate enough morality and if we can just make it happen, you know, then we can get Jesus to come back and rule over us. No. Nope. He's just going to come when he decides to come. Therefore, we haven't been called to try to Christianize one country, but instead we've been called to lead people into the kingdom of God. We've been called to lead people to become citizens of our heavenly country. In order to prove my perspective, I would remind you about the great commission that Christ has given to his church. And with this as the focus, I'd like you to turn with me in our Bibles to the gospel of Matthew. If you would, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. And as you make your way to the 28th chapter of Matthew's gospel account, I should take a moment to remind you that it was actually after his death, after his burial, after his resurrection, when the Lord Jesus then presented his disciples with what we know to be the Great Commission. And listen, this is the same commission that Jesus not only gave to the disciples who were there with him, but this is the same commission that every Christian has received. This is our Great Commission. This is what we are called to accomplish here in the 21st century. But this as the focus. Look with me here at Matthew chapter 28. I want to begin reading there at verse 18. Here the Lord Jesus declares, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's announcing his ultimate authority over all of heaven and earth. He says, all authority has been given to me, not some authority, all authority. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ over all of heaven and over all of earth. And the one who has all authority has now commissioned those who follow him. Jesus he already has all authority over the kingdoms of the earth. But rather than directing his disciples to take that authority and go start setting up, you know, little Christian kingdoms everywhere, he didn't say that. And he didn't say, go and gain control over the governments of the world. Didn't say that either. Instead, he directed them to go make disciples. And this begins when we go and proclaim the truth of his teachings, starting with the gospel, the call for people to repent and receive by faith the free gift of forgiveness by, by faith in, in, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, now, don't get me wrong, because listen, I'm all for Christian leaders in our government. Those of you who have been here long enough know that I'm, I'm all for electing Christians to lead our country. At the same time, though, we must not fail to realize that the great commission that we've been given has less to do with the Christian control of human government, and it has more to do, and I would say so much more to do, with the godly goal of leading people to Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that this is true regardless of who ends up in the White House. The Great Commission is true regardless of who is leading our nation. Christian, listen, if our country is being run by fascists who are trying to suppress our speech, this doesn't change the Great Commission that we've received. And if our nation is being run by Marxists who are stealing our wealth and giving it to others, you know, this doesn't change the great commission that Christ Jesus has given to his church. At the end of the day, the church has been called to accomplish one very important thing, the great commission. We've been called to make disciples of the nations, regardless of the political ideologies of the leaders of any given nation. The Lord sends you to China, 
you're supposed to accomplish the Great Commission in China. If the, the Lord sends you to Uruguay, you're supposed to accomplish the Great Commission there. Wherever you're supposed to be, wherever the Lord is calling you, there you are supposed to accomplish the Great Commission by preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I should also point out that this common goal ought to unify us regardless of the political point of view that we personally hold. Chances are you prefer one political party over the other. I'm just guessing. But that's what all the polls would lead me to believe. I have no doubt that we all personally want our guy to win. We want our candidate to win and, and, and go into the White House. And, and, and while this could become a basis for division amongst the disciples of Christ, it's important for us to realize that, that, that the church who is submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ, we will be able to maintain our unity as we set out to accomplish the Great Commission as our primary purpose. And we can get into, you know, political debates all day long, but at the end of the day, if we can both just sit there and say, yes, let's go make disciples, then this ought to unify us. Sadly, there are many disciples who are allowing earthly politics to divide their Christian congregation. And one reason why is due to the fact that so many of us are much more committed to our political position than we are with becoming those believers who are committed to the great commission of Jesus Christ. We'd much rather have a political conversation than share the gospel. And if this sounds like something that you struggle with, then I encourage you to remember something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. Our Savior, he was speaking with the apostle Peter, and there he assures the apostle in this way. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, listen, the Lord Jesus is the one who's building his church. He didn't say he's going to build a government, he said he's going to build his church. And we must not fail to realize that the church is currently being built in some ways, you know, as we talk about the church here on earth, you know, the church is currently being built here on the, on, on the earth between two gates. The church is being built between the gates of hell and the gates of heaven. In order to grasp the point that I'm trying to make, we, we need to understand that the gates of a kingdom during ancient times they were oftentimes used as the location for, uh, you know, where city leaders would gather together and make decisions and, and, and pass judgments and these sorts of things. During ancient times, it was at the main entry point of a city because that was the, the weak point in the wall. That's where the leaders would gather and, and they would, you know, make sure that, you know, people were coming in that were supposed to come in and not coming in if they weren't supposed to come in. And this is where legal matters were handled and business transactions were conducted at the gates of the city. And with that in mind, consider again what Jesus is saying here when he declares, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Who's at the gates? The leaders. The leaders of the kingdom are at the gates. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the, the, that the leaders who are gathering together against the church are ultimately going to fail as they set out to accomplish their evil plans. If the leaders who are gathered together at the gates of Hades set out to destroy the church, Jesus says, don't worry about it. He says, I'm building my church. The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. So what are we worried about then? He's saying, quit worrying about the leaders who are at the gates of Hades trying to destroy the church and focus on the fact that I just gave you a set of keys that can actually unlock the gates into heaven. That's your responsibility to take those keys and unlock the gates of heaven so that people can come in there. We've been given the gospel of grace. And we're to take the gospel of grace and use it like a key that unlocks the gates of heaven. And as we work together to proclaim the gospel of grace, 
we're not only enabling sinners the opportunity to repent and trust in Jesus Christ and enter into the kingdom of heaven, but listen, we're simultaneously maintaining the unity of the church as we work together to accomplish the great commission of our king. If we set out to fight against the leaders who are at the gates of hell, we're going to be fighting on all kinds of different battlefronts because the leaders who are at the gates of hell are coming at the church with all kinds of different attack plans. And this Christian is saying, well, I got to fight against this battle. And that Christian says, well, I got to fight against that battle. And it's this battle and that battle. And we're all divided. Why? Because the enemy scatters us in different directions. Whereas if we would all simply just focus on the one thing that we've been told to do, preach the gospel, make disciples, well, then we'd be unified. We would be a unified front accomplishing the great commission that we've been given. But this has the goal, I encourage every Christian to remember something that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. If you would consider with me uh, here in Ephesians chapter four, what Paul is saying when he declares, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Christian, listen. We've been called to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Therefore, rather than dividing with one another over political issues, let's remember that our faith in Jesus Christ has actually become the basis for true Christian unity. It's the spirit of the Lord who has sealed us together into our spiritual community. It's the hope of our calling that helps us to work together as we set out to accomplish the primary purpose for the church, which is the great commission of Jesus Christ. Sadly, the enemy is attempting to keep us from maintaining, maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And you better believe that the devil and his demons are doing everything they can to create division amongst the disciples of Christ. The leaders at the gates of Hades are trying to scatter us in different directions so that we might spend more of our time and energy fighting with one another than accomplishing the goal that God has given us. This reminds me of an anecdote I recently read about red and black ants. According to this story, if you catch about 100 red fire ants that live in the southwestern desert and about 100 of those large black ants that live there also, drop them into the same jar, not much will happen until you shake the jar vigorously and dump them out onto the ground. Then the red ants will attack the black ants. The black ants will attack the red ants. They'll devastate each other. They'll bite. They'll sting. They'll fight to the death. The thing is, the red ants think the black ants are the enemy, and the black ants think that the, the enemy is the red ants. But all those ants put together never do figure out that the real enemy was the one who was shaking the jar. And Christian, listen, the, the, the church is like that jar, and the devil's coming along and just shaking the church. And we bump into one another. We step on one another's toes. And next thing you know, we're dividing with one another because we think the other person must be the enemy here. It's for this reason that Paul encouraged every Christian to realize that we need to stop fighting with one another. And we need to realize that there's an enemy out there shaking the jar. Therefore, we need to endeavor, work hard, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I should also remind you that the Lord has called us to love those who we would consider our political opponents. But this as the focus, I want to consider something that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. If you would turn with me to the book of Romans, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 12. As you make your way to the 12th chapter of Romans, I should take a moment to remind you that the Lord Jesus, he came to save sinners. 
and, and not just the Republican centers. He also came to save the Democratic centers and, and the liberal centers. And he came to save sinners, regardless of our political point of view. Jesus wants to save Democrats. He wants to save Republicans. And, and, and somebody even suggests he, he might even save a libertarian. I don't know. I, mean, I guess you could make a biblical case for that. Listen, Jesus wants to save racists and fascists, communists and nationalists. Just to sum it up, the Lord isn't willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to repentance so that they might be saved by faith in his sacrifice. And it's for this reason that the Lord Jesus has called us to, to go and actually reveal his love to others as we learn to love our enemies. So let's consider how Paul puts it here in Romans chapter 12. Look with me there beginning at verse 14. Here Paul declares, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, it isn't always, but if it is, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here in these verses, we find Paul encouraging the Christians in Rome to become believers who are actually going out of their way to bless those who are persecuting the church. Not only that, but Paul also instructed them to realize that we don't need to secure our own vengeance. You know, some Christians sit around thinking about how to get revenge all day long. Just plotting and scheming and they, their mind is consumed with getting revenge on someone who hurt them. And yet Paul says, don't avenge yourselves. Let God take care of that. We don't need to settle the score with those who have hurt us. No, instead, we've been called to overcome evil with good. Now, there are many ways for us to overcome evil with good, many different routes that we could take to, to overcome evil with good. And yet I would argue that the very best way for us to overcome evil with good is by leading those who are lost to the foot of the cross so that they might become our brothers and sisters in Christ. If, if you have a, an, an enemy who doesn't know Jesus yet and, and you want to, to actually help them, lead them to Jesus. Because getting your own revenge, you know, it doesn't solve anything. But if you lead your enemy to Jesus and they become a new creation in Christ Jesus, haven't you actually fixed the animosity? Haven't you solved the problem between you and them? You, you can actually uh, accomplish unity with your enemy by leading your enemy to Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, now they're part of the Christian community. You defeated your enemy in that way. With this as the goal, I want to remind you of something that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Consider what Paul meant when he said, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Christian, listen. The world is filled with people who we perceive to be our enemy. 
The world is filled with people that we perceive to be our enemy. And yet, according to Paul, they're the unwitting servants of Satan, having been taken captive by him to do his will. And while we might be tempted to see them as our enemies who who need to be put in their place, the Lord would lead us to see them as captives who need to be set free from the deceptions of the devil. Therefore, rather than spending all of our days engaging in all these sorts of political arguments that are only just going to cause further division between you and them, why not instead present them with the gospel message of God's grace so that they might become you know, believers, so that they might come to their senses and escape the snare of Satan? As we consider all these verses tonight, it's my hope that we would all realize that the Christian community, which is completely committed to the great commission of Jesus Christ, this is the community uh, which will experience the unity of the spirit that results in the bond of peace. If if we come here with our political agenda and it's just a matter of, I'm going to make sure everybody agrees with me and then we divide with those who don't, there's no unity in that. And I'm not suggesting that we all give up our political point of view. I certainly have mine. And it's the right one, in case you're wondering. But listen, we've been called to unify. And I guarantee you that we are not going to unify over political ideologies. But the one thing that we can unify around is Jesus Christ and his great commission. It's for this reason that I encourage every Christian to realize that the Great Commission is more important than our personal political point of view. Not only that, but listen, it's also important for us to maintain our unity by praying together for our leaders. I like the way that Paul put it in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It's there where he declares, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Christian, listen, whoever wins this election, they're going to need our prayers. Whoever ends up in the White House, I guess maybe by January... They're going to need our prayers. And one reason why is because our nation is completely divided. Uh, They were already rioting and looting last night before anybody even won. (laughs) Are you kidding me? At least wait till we find out who won to start rioting and then, you know, have fun. No, I'm joking. Don't. Don't do that. But clearly our nation is completely divided. And one reason why, church, is because so few Christians actually preach the gospel message. So few of us actually lead the lost to Christ. And so few of us are praying for our nation. So few of us are praying for the leaders. We'd rather talk bad about them. We'd rather type something horrible about them than pray for them. You better believe that whoever wins this election is going to need the prayers of the church. And you better believe that the losing party is also going to need the prayers of the church because they're going to question the results of the election. If your candidate wins, let's join together as a church and pray for them. If the other candidate wins, let's join together as a church and pray for them. And when we say, okay, we're going to pray together for the leaders of our nation, this unifies us rather than dividing us over our political point of view. Listen, if we can agree upon anything tonight, it's this, that the followers of of Christ Jesus ought to be praying for the leaders of our nation. And especially if we think that the wrong person ended up with the job. How much more should we be praying for them? 
Rather than allowing this election to divide our church, let's endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And we do this by simply agreeing that we're going to pray together for all those who are in authority. And as we pray for those who are in authority, well, then we're able to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and with all reverence. Now, as we begin to wrap up this message, it's important for us to remember that the Christian church We've been called to keep the unity. We've been called to endeavor, to work hard, to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Therefore, rather than allowing our political positions to divide the disciples here at our church, let's focus instead on the truths that unite us, which includes the great commission of Christ Jesus. It also includes our call to pray for those who have been called to lead our nation. Finally, I encourage you to remember that it won't be long before all of the, the, the bad leaders are gone. It won't be long before the king of kings comes. It won't be long before the king of kings establishes his kingdom as he ushers in everlasting righteousness. And with that being the case, I encourage you, regardless of who wins this election, let's hold on to this heavenly hope. And as we hold on to this heavenly hope, let's look forward to that day when we will stand in the presence of the King of Kings and with one heart and one voice, we will declare blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Amen.